Thank you. Thank you. Well, before I get started, I'd just uh, like to say thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. And thank you for taking time out of your day coming to hear the presentation. I really appreciate it. Hopefully I'll impart something that uh, you will feel like you haven't wasted your time. So I guess to start with, uh, I changed the title if you saw the advertisement on the website. Changed the title a little bit, shortened it just to a search for a Texas identity in the Republic of Texas. I thought that was a, a, a little less pretentious than the other the death knell of distinctiveness and so forth. So same topic, though, in the same presentation, just a slightly different title. And I guess uh, I'd like to start by asking a general question. Has Texas ever possessed a unique identity in its long history? Before y'all blurt out the answers, just rhetorical, just for you to think about for a minute. This seemingly simple question has been at the forefront of serious scholarly debate for more than three decades. One's answer to this question will likely depend on whether you subscribe to the traditionalist interpretation of Texas or whether you accept the arguments of revisionist and post-revisionist. So in 1991, Walter Binger and Robert Calvert, Bob Calvert to his friends, uh, in their groundbreaking study, Texas Through Time Evolving Interpretations, challenged the iconic view of Texas distinctiveness, suggesting that new approaches to Texas history were in order. Since the publication of their work, revisionist and post-revisionist have attempted with some degree of success to answer Binger's and uh, Calvert's clarion call by shifting towards a new paradigm. This generation of scholars has argued that a new meta-narrative is, ne is needed, one that will hold more significance to a modern multicultural society. In doing so, they have aspired to move beyond the traditional conceptual framework used to decode the past, including hero worship of Anglo leaders the adulation of the Texas Revolution, the brief dominance of the cattle kingdom, and the economic supremacy of oil. Additionally, they've challenged the notion of uh, Texas distinctiveness and the existence of a unique Lone Star identity. Admittedly, I'm not here today to refute the works of the uh, revisionist and post-revisionist. Instead, I want to consider whether for a moment in time, if a distinctive identity existed in the Republic of Texas. Arguably, if the Republic had become the great empire that many Texans had envisioned, it seems reasonable to suggest that it would have fostered an identity similar to, yet separate from, the United States. Nevertheless, the empire failed to materialize, a circumstance that contributed significantly to annexation. Thus, the end of the Republic represented the death knell of a unique Texas, leaving in its wake an Americanized state. One of the earliest authors who considered writing a history of Texas was Mary Beau B. Lamar. During his first visit to Nacogdoches, Lamar expressed his interest in the history of Mexico's northern province a curiosity that likely resulted from the Georgian's experience as a newspaper editor and his personal affinity for historical literature. Shortly after the Battle of San Jacinto, he began collecting reminiscence of early Texas. Lamar planned to use these documents to chronicle his country's emergence from its beginning as a Spanish frontier to its status as an independent nation. As historian uh, Laura Lyons McLemore suggests, Lamar had hoped that such an account might justify the actions of the Texas revolutionaries and aid in the nation's effort to, quote, obtain efforts to obtain diplomatic recognition for the republic, end of quote. Despite amassing a substantial collection of documents, Lamar never completed his project. 
Perhaps the task of writing a comprehensive national history proved too overwhelming, especially given the circumstances of his troubled political career. Regardless, if Lamar had completed his proposed tome, it undoubtedly would have followed the same general trends found in the late 19th century and early 20th century historiography, which primarily focused on the Anglo perspective. For more than 100 years, scholars concluded that the history of the Republic rested on two basic tenets. Anglo migration west of the Sabine River and white settlers' efforts to secure control of Texas. According to traditional accounts, the Lone Star Nation, or according to these traditional accounts of the Lone Star Nation, Texans generally were portrayed as courageous, bold, adventurous, and heroic. And they marched over the land, defeating the savage Indians and the Mexican mongrels who stood in their way. In the wake of their glorious victory over an oppressive and inferior Mexican government, as they would see it, Anglo-Texans established a democratic republic and engaged in a long-standing struggle to eradicate threats posed by their darker-skinned foes. For traditionalists, the real story of Texas began with the defeat of Santa Ana at San Jacinto. The problem with this historical interpretation is that it presents a false or at least an incomplete narrative, one commonly labeled as the, quote, Texas myth. As with all myths, the traditional narrative contains a grain of truth, but its lack of objectivity often denigrates the realities of the past through oversimplification and an un wavering devotion to 19th and early 20th century cultural values. While correctly identifying the Anglo male's eventual dominance of the political, social, and economic institutions of Texas, the traditional narratives often ignored or ignores or at least downplays the impact of Tejanos, American Indians, and African Americans, both slave and free. It also leaves out oftentimes women and other cultural and ethnic groups. Though many scholars have abandoned this interpretation during the past two to three decades, the Texas myth endures perpetuating and in many cases celebrating the idea of Anglo male superiority. Thus the legacy of the myth makers, whether intentional or inadvertent, is a body of scholarship based on half truths and flawed analysis that continues to muddy or muddle the past. As Walter Binger commented in 1991, it is somewhat bewildering that this interpretation has endured such a long shelf life. <clears throat> the Texas myth has persisted or persistently maintained its hold on the Republic of Texas. In part, or at least one reason for its tenacity is the limited number of modern studies focusing on the historical era. Aside from biographies and topical studies, historians have published few comprehensive accounts of the Lone Star Nation, at least during the past three decades. In fact, modern scholars have been more fascinated with the Texas Revolution. Though the causes of the revolution and its outcome remains important to our understanding of the emergence of the Lone Star Nation, it is puzzling that historians have paid such limited attention to the Republic, an independent country that survived for almost a decade before being annexed into, into the United States. In addition, to, in, in addition to covering the revolution, modern historians have examined in detail the experiences of Tejanos, Native Americans, African Americans, and women in the years both before and after 1836. These scholars have done much to discredit the Texas myth. This is in the last two to three decades. It's done much to discredit the Texas myth 
and has provided a richer understanding of the ethnic and racial diversity within the Republic. Yet at the same time, their efforts have left the story of this period fragmented and incomplete. Perhaps the one exception to the trend, or to this trend, modern trend, is Andrew Torgett's Seeds of Empire, Cotton, Slavery, and the Transformation of the Texas Borderlands from 1800 to 1850. Torgett provides a sweeping account of cotton production and slavery, or how cotton production and slavery shaped events in Mexican Texas, leading eventually to the outbreak of the revolution and the creation of a new republic, predicated on the idea of becoming the first fully committed slaveholding nation in North America. In essence, the Seeds of Empire connects early Texas to the broader Atlantic world, especially the Lower South in the United States. Scholars should commend Torgett's attempt to break from the traditional narrative and for, its advan and for advancing a thought-provoking analysis that seeks to explain how and why white males eventually dominated the institutions of Texas between the Republic era and early statehood. While there's no doubt that the cotton culture and slavery significantly influenced the development of early Texas, one potential problem or concern about the seeds of empire remains, and that is it, over, it oversimplifies um, and provides an incorrect interpretation that there is a homogeneous identity that existed in Texas at the time of which the study covers. As such, <clears throat> Students of the Lone Star Nation might be tempted to use this nuanced and worthy contribution to argue in favor of exceptionalism, coming full circle to earlier claims that Texas was exclusively Southern. While their analysis would hold true for some segments of the population, it would ignore the regional differences in the Republic that had little or no connection to cotton production or slavery. For example, how would Native Americans fit into a narrative based on a southern motif? Well, what I want to do for um, the rest of my time is examine some of the conclusions that my co-authors, or my co-author, editor rather, I'm sorry, co-editor of, um, of uh, Beyond, or Single Star of the West, Charles Swanland, what we found while working on this particular book. And um, when Charles and I first conceived this volume, one of our primary goals was to examine whether a unique identity existed during the Republic. We posited that if a Texas identity ever existed, it was surely would have existed during this time, during this Republic, when it was a nation, this period between the revolution and annexation. However, I hate to say our efforts failed. Begrudgingly, we had to accept the fact that a homogeneous identity did not exist during the era. This discovery will come as no surprise to some historians, but it will change or it will challenge the views, certainly of the general public, whose understanding of the early um, of early Texas primarily has been shaped by traditional interpretations. Though a single cultural identity remained elusive, we did discover that the Republic was a place of uh, cultural confluences. This area, it was, a, it was a region, a geographical region, and has been from its very existence where multiculturals had come together, like a crossroads, a cultural crossroads from its earliest existence. Well, despite the fact that uh, Anglos increasingly gained cultural, social, and economic dominance early in the Republic, other groups retained significant influence within society. In this regard, perhaps it is more beneficial to examine regional identities within the Republic. As such, one can make the argument that 
ethnic and cultural conclaves and their interaction with one another are more important to scholarly understanding than any singular homogeneous cultural characteristic. It's interesting to note, however, that the various culture groups inhabiting Texas during the Republic initially shared common values and beliefs. Excluding slaves, perhaps, the greatest commonality among these diverse groups, both male and female, was their belief that Texas was a land of opportunity. Free blacks, though limited in number, Native Americans, Tejanos, Anglos, and Europeans saw the region as a place of potential prosperity. However, as Anglo-Texans increasingly gained dominance, visions of prosperity quickly faded for other ethnic and racial groups. Charles, a uh, co-editor, and I approached Single Star of the West with two purposes in mind. First, we wanted to renew scholarly interest in the Republic. And second, we hope to provide the first step toward a new understanding of the Lone Star Nation. Only time will tell if we've been successful. With this in mind, let us examine some of the conclusions and insights that the contributors to our volume suggested about the emergence and development of the Republic. Bruce Winders, a historian and a former curator of the Alamo, is rightly posited that one cannot understand the Republic era without a broad understanding of the causes of the Mexican Revolution, especially the political clash between Mexican centralist and Federalist. In part, the conflict between these competing factions led to the creation of the Republic. Most importantly, the struggle to gain control of the Mexican government can be associated with larger global phenomena, <coughs> one in which citizens in various countries were challenging the legitimacy of their own governing bodies. As such, the Mexican Revolution of 1821 as well as the Texas Revolution of 1836 is comparable with the American, French, and Latin American revolutions of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Similar to these revolutionary movements, different cultural, ethnic, and social groups contributed significantly to Texas independence and to the creation of the republic that followed. In this context, an alliance between Anglo and Tejano leaders emerged and influenced the establishment of a new republic forged from their political and economic beliefs. Paul Spellman, instructor of history at Wharton County Junior College, refers to these men as the leading voices of the Texas Revolution. Here was the genesis of what might have been a republic founded on multicultural ideas leading to a unique Texas identity. However, many of those involved in the movement either died during the conflict or shortly afterwards, silencing their voice before they could fully contribute, or contribute to the creation of the new government. For those who survived, circumstances often beyond their control, diminished their influence on the establishment of the new republic. As James Crisp, Professor Emeritus of History at uh, North Carolina State University notes, the opportunities for Anglo-Texan, for the Anglo-Tejano Anglo Alliance to create a unique identity quickly faded after the failure of the ill-fated Santa Fe expedition in 1841 and the subsequent Mexican invasion of 1842. The latter raids led Anglos to distrust the national loyalty of Tejanos, resulting in the calculated efforts to weaken the civil and legal rights of Mexican Texans and severing whatever equitable political bonds existed between the two groups. Texas is long touted 
the martial skills and bravery of its military leaders and the men under uh, their command. While such praise is warranted in specific cases, there is another side to the Republic's military, which generally receives less attention. Joseph Dawson, uh, professor emeritus of history at Texas A&M University, claims the military represented a conundrum for the Republic. While it was necessary to maintain a standing army to protect the nation's interest, there were inherent dangers in sustaining a sizable military force. In particular, poor financial circumstances made it difficult for the Republic to properly provision its troops. Creating a disgruntled armed force, uh, an armed force, which military commanders potentially could have utilized in a coup against the national government. So in other words, you have a large contingent of armed men, they're disgruntled, they could be used to overthrow or topple the, the Texas government. One only needs to remember Felix Houston, often referred to him as Huston because I just hate to give him the same sounding name as Sam Houston because he's much more of a nef nefarious kind of character. But Felix Houston's activities during President Houston's first term to realize the problem civil authorities had controlling its army. As a matter of fact, Sam Houston had disbanded the army, uh, furlough them. Additionally, it is interesting to note that while the army began as a biracial organization initially created to win and preserve the independent status of Texas, it quickly evolved into an Anglo-dominated force used to enact control over non-white groups such as the Cherokee in East Texas. In similar fashion, political leaders experienced a love-hate relationship with the Texas Navy, especially during the Houston administration. Nevertheless, Gary Joyner, who's associate professor of history at Louisiana State University, Shreveport, suggests that the Navy proved vital in protecting the Republic's coastline. And given its close relationship with the United States, United States Navy, it helped to pave the way for annexation in 1845. Though both the Lone Star Army and Navy exhibited some unique characteristics and reflected Texas society in various ways, neither military organization produced a distinctive Texas identity. In fact, both tended to mimic the military institutions of the United States. The Texas Rangers have probably been mythologized more than any other agency. Traditionalists have argued that the Rangers were hardened men who heroically protected the frontier settlers. In many ways, they were Texas version, version a version of knights in shining armor. There's no doubt that contemporary views of the Rangers represented the genesis of the traditionalist interpretation of this group of lawmen. During the Republic, Anglos certainly viewed members of this iconic force as patriot warriors, giving credence to the traditionalist perspective. But Tejanos and Native Americans often considered the Rangers as bloody avengers, providing a the revisionist, and particularly post-revisionist, reason to question the organization's brand of justice. Complicating the story of the Texas Rangers is the argument of uh, Bruce Glassroot and Harold Weiss, Jr., editors of a two-volume study the, uh, titled Track, uh, Tracking the Texas Rangers, which is published by University of North Texas Press. But they contend that the Rangers a paramilitary force that evolved from a hybrid of, of uh, Anglo-European, Native American, and Spanish traditions was essentially used by Anglo political leaders to challenge and suppress non-white cultural groups on the frontier. As such, the Texas Rangers con contributed significantly to Anglo dominance in the newly independent nation, 
a notion, a notion that's often glossed over in traditional interpretations. Two aspects of the Republic's existence that have received scholarly attention in its political and the, is its political and economic institutions. Regardless, these areas still represent fertile ground for new research. In particular, let me share two insights. Scholars generally portray Sam Houston as the indispensable man. While viewing Mary Beau Lamar as the vile villain. Both of them were Republic, uh, presidents of the Republic of Texas. Now, I'm not sure that historians have cast either individual, either president, in the proper light. For example, for all his significance to the founding of the nation, Houston was a notoriously ambitious politician who attempted to destroy his political enemies. And sometimes I make mention of this to some of my colleagues. I'm like, who oh, will profess, you know, they, they have a great fondness for, for Sam Houston, in which I do in my own right have a great fondness for Sam Houston. He's a great um, Texas hero in my mind. But then they will criticize Andrew Jackson as a tyrant and so forth. I'm like, well, you can't like Sam Houston and not like Andrew Jackson. They're the same. They're the same political animal. And, of course, we all know that Sam Houston was uh, a protege of Andrew Jackson. Jackson was his mentor. They knew each other from the War of 1812. They'd come in contact. So you couldn't like one without the other. And I often find that interesting how there's almost this great reverence for, for Houston, but a great hatred, it seems like, for Jackson. Anyway, that's my own personal thing. <laughs> um, but um, so, so uh, Houston, he would destroy his political enemies. Given his venomous commentary on Lamar's administration, one wonders where the scorned president's reputation, Lamar's, has suffered solely based on the merits of his failed leadership or if he was the victim of Houston's desire to save his own political career. Because at the time he ran for president, the second time, he, he, he wasn't well received by a lot of Texans at that time. I say this not in defense of Lamar, but rather to suggest that scholarly treatment of his presidency have largely been shaped by the views of Houston and his supporters, rather than an objective understanding of the man and the events that, have in, that influenced Lamar's executive decisions. In reality, both men experienced some degree of success, at least according to their contemporaries, and both exhibited serious character flaws, once again, according to their contemporaries. At the risk of suffering the wrath of Sam Houston scholars, which I noticed there's no back door, but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> let me express an observation about Texas historiography. A, a deeper understanding of politics during the Republic will not be forth forthcoming until scholars have recognized and abandoned their own kind of pro-Houston bias because seems like they take Houston at his word and it's gold and then his opponents they dismiss out of hand. So I think there's probably a room for a balance in that. The Texas economy also served as fertile grounds for understanding the development of the Republic, especially given the economic factors often shape, uh, that economic factors often shape political and social institutions during the era. Examining the Republic from a transnational perspective, Walter Binger convincingly argues that the Atlantic world significantly influenced the Texas economy. This is the same argument we would see from Andrew Torget in the Seeds of Empire in this Atlantic world perspective. Binger, however, <clears throat> does not claim the existence of economic homogeneity. Instead, he points out that distinctive and evolving cultural pockets or island communities 
emerged and that at least six types of Texans and economies existed. There was a Lower South, an Upper South, a German, a Comanche, Apache, and Tejano regions and economies that existed. And then there's a, that would be five, and so there's six. The sixth one is one that's kind of an amalgamation of all of those kind of different cultural groups together, emergence of them together. Each group contributed in unique ways to the economic development of the regions where they settled. Nonetheless, just as Torget suggests in the Seeds of Empire, the Lower South economy eventually would become the more dominant for the, at the end of the Republic and then on into the statehood, early statehood. While Single Star of the West examines many other aspects of life in the Republic, time really will not permit me to cover them all. However, if time was not an issue, we might broach topics such as the experience of women, Native Americans, slaves, free blacks, Tejanos, and the development of Protestantism in the Lone Star Nation. Each is significant to the understanding of the Republic in their own unique way. In closing, I would encourage you to remember that identity is a construct created by scholars to explain worlds that they cannot physically visit but instead can only understand through the examination of incomplete historical records. Therefore, as the debate continues as to whether a unique Texas identity existed or has ever existed, scholarly understanding of what it means to be a Texan, which would be our identity, will undoubtedly change with the passing of time. In this regard, a note of caution is in order, I believe, personally. Historians who work to challenge the Texas myth may simply be substituting a new myth in place of the old one. A myth they might find more palatable to modern society, but still a myth nevertheless. For me, I believe the story of Texas history and perhaps a Texas identity, the story of a Texas identity, is found somewhere in between the two camps of traditionalist and revisionist and post-revisionist. It's waiting to be discovered and to be accepted. Thank you.